just a few more comments on the RNA viruses that are uh, unique and interesting. Um, there are three main RNA virus strategies. There's single-stranded RNA viruses, double-stranded RNA viruses, and then the retroviruses. I'll show you retroviruses in just a minute, but I want you to understand that um, the single-stranded and double-stranded RNA viruses require a unique RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And that should make sense. If you think about the RNA polymerase uh, that's in your cells already, um, <clears throat> that is for transcription, and it reads a double-stranded DNA molecule and makes a single-stranded RNA molecule. The virus gets inside and wants to take over and use your machinery to make more of itself, but it brought RNA with it, not double-stranded DNA. So your RNA polymerase will not recognize an RNA molecule. It can't read RNA and make more RNA from it because your RNA polymerase is DNA dependent. So the RNA viruses typically encode their own unique RNA polymerase that is RNA dependent. And not only do they bring the gene along with them, but in order to express the gene, you've got to have that RNA polymerase, right? Which came first, the RNA dependent RNA polymerase or the egg. But in this case, they have to actually package a couple copies of the enzyme itself in the capsid and bring it along with them so they can begin the process of replication and transcription once they get inside. So that's a, a unique aspect of being an RNA virus and we'll talk briefly about that when we talk about the influenza viruses as well. But I also wanted to mention what retroviruses are. These are a, a sort of a subclass of the single-stranded RNA viruses. By no means are all single-stranded RNA viruses retroviruses. But I want to talk you through the life cycle of a retrovirus because it's a little bit unique and some of the terms that are used can be a little bit unique. Uh, in retrovirus language, we talk about entrance that's equivalent to um, attachment and entry or attachment and penetration. And that entrance, uh, in the case of HIV at least, is by fusion with the host cell membrane. So you get membrane fusion. The retroviruses tend to be enveloped, though I suppose uh, there, there are likely some, some non-enveloped retroviruses out there. HIV is the example, though, is an enveloped virus, and you're going to get host membrane uh, fusion with the envelope around the virus. And in particular, the target cells are the CD4 uh, helper T cells, and we'll talk more about those at the end of the semester. So it's part of your, your immune system, and this is why people with uh, HIV, people with AIDS in particular, are um, often highly susceptible to secondary, lots of secondary infections that you and I maybe wouldn't be susceptible to. Now, once it gets inside, the capsid needs to be uncoated, and that actually takes place at the membrane. So as it is brought in, there are proteases that immediately chew up the capsid. But this is one of the unusual exceptions to the rule, where we don't go from capsid directly to RNA. We go from capsid to something called a core. That core is, for all intents and purposes, it's a capsid inside the capsid. These are proteins that are there to protect the RNA molecules themselves. That core remains intact during all this process. Now, reverse transcription is the next step. Um, the retroviruses package with themselves, and they code also uh, to make more of this reverse transcriptase. Reverse transcriptase can read a single-stranded RNA molecule and make a double-stranded DNA out of it. You can see where it gets its name, reverse transcriptase. It's the reverse of transcription. Transcription is reading a double-stranded DNA making a single-stranded RNA. This is the opposite direction. So now we've got a double-stranded DNA copy of the original single-stranded RNA, and that is imported into the cell nucleus where it's integrated randomly into the genome. So literally, an enzyme called integrase cuts the host cell genome, your CD4 T cell genome, opens it up, inserts this double-stranded uh, uh, provirus, and closes it back up. It ligates it back closed again. And now there's essentially what amounts to a, a, a nearly eternal uh, permanent supply of information to make more HIV variants. Now, after integration, uh, it can just sit there latent uh, for, for days, weeks, months, years, decades. In some cases, it sits latent for an entire lifetime. In most cases, eventually, uh, it does initiate transcription. There's some sort of an activation that happens, and the viral mRNAs are produced, which leads to assembly and maturation. HIV uh, researchers tend to call this encapsidation, but this is the, the maturation process. Makes use of a protease. Uh, the capsid uh, proteins, the capsomeres, are often produced in long uh, polymers of each other, and the protease comes along and clips them into the individual monomers so they can fold properly. The reason I even bring that up is because both integrase and protease 
are targets of HIV therapy. So when you hear about integrase inhibitors and protease inhibitors in HIV therapy, I want you to understand exactly where in this life cycle these are uh, acting. Uh, and then finally, they get released by budding because they're enveloped variants. They squeeze their way out. They, uh, they take some of the host cell membrane with them. Uh, they've created some of their own uh, spikes on the surface that will allow them to attach to the next CD4 T cell, and the cycle continues. Now at the bottom, I've got HIV-1 as a recognizable example. You may not have heard of Roos sarcoma virus. This is, um, this is arguably the first retrovirus that has ever been discovered or was ever discovered and ever studied. It causes cancer. Uh, it causes cancer particularly in rats, and so it's safe for, for humans to work with. Oops. That's handy. So it's safe for humans to work with. Um, and so it's become sort of the E. coli of the, the retrovirus world where a lot of work gets done with Roos sarcoma. But as a cancer-causing virus, it also is classified then not only as retrovirus, but as an oncovirus, as in cancer-causing. All right, finally, I want to mention this idea of latency. HIV is a good example of latency. Um, another uh, example of latency would be the varicella zoster virus, the virus that causes... Um, chicken pox and shingles. So if someone gets shingles, you see that picture on the left, and in many cases, as the immune system wins, there appears to be <clears throat> some leftover virions that essentially retreat or take refuge in nerve cell bundles, uh, in sensory nerves in particular, and usually in bands around, uh, around the waist or sometimes around the neck and, and less commonly around the face, and it's almost always one side or the other, but not both. Um, when latent varicella zoster virus hiding in those, those sensory nerve bundles reactivates, it leads to a different kind of illness we call shingles. Shingles is typically thought of as non-contagious, though more and more we're seeing um, examples, exceptions to that, where someone has picked up, um, has picked up um, uh, chicken pox. Now you can't get shingles from shingles, uh, though in theory you should be able to uh, get chicken pox from shingles, meaning someone who has shingles uh, their health care provider or someone else is taking care of them. If that person has not been adequately vaccinated and never been exposed to VZV, they may potentially get chicken pox. For a long time it was believed you couldn't get that transmission, that it was that shingles itself was non-contagious, um, but there's some debate about that now. Uh, this, this dormant virus, this latent virus, is referred to as a provirus. So I hope that's helpful. If there were things that I said that didn't make sense, go back, play it back a couple times, look up terminology if you need to, and make sure you're uh, comparing what we just talked about with what's in your textbook.